It's very difficult to package a mid-sized EV so effectively that up to seven people can sit inside it. But Mercedes has pulled off that feat with this car, the EQB, which usefully broadens its electric vehicle lineup. It's based, of course, on the combustion engine GLB crossover and shares much of that car's premium appeal. There's a flood of mid-size crossover electric vehicles out there at present, so any fresh class entrant had better have something fairly unique to offer. Fortunately, this one does, the Mercedes EQB. It's one of what seems like a continual stream of different Mercedes EQ electric models, with the B, in this case, standing not for the brand's mini MPV, but designating instead something you may have already guessed from a quick glance at this car. The fact that this is the full battery version of the Stuttgart maker's GLB mid-sized SUV. The GLB's strongest point of differentiation from rivals is its seven-seat format, a USP carried over to this EQB to set it apart in its overcrowded sector. At the time of this test in summer 2022, just after this model's introduction, that third seating row really was quite a unique attribute for EV customers in our market. From launch, its only full EV seven-seat rivals were either cheap converted vans from Peugeot, Citroën and Vauxhall, or a rather more expensive converted van from Mercedes itself, the enormous EQV, or a Tesla Model X costing nearly six figures. But Mercedes knows it won't have this mid-market space to itself for very long. Tesla has plans to soon offer its similarly sized Model Y hatch in seven-seat form, and other brands will surely follow. Engineering and technology-wise, this car shares everything that matters with its smaller EQA hatch stablemate, including a slightly compromised MFA2 chassis, not originally designed for EV use. This model hails from quite a different production facility, though. Instead of Rastatt in Germany, it's screwed together in Kekskmet in Hungary, where the GLB is built. A change from the original plan, which would have seen the EQB produced in Daimler's French Hambach plant alongside little smart cars. Regardless of provenance, though, what we've got here looks as if it might be a smart choice for a forward-thinking family. Is it? Well, you're going to need the industry's most comprehensive review, the car and driving road test, to find out. Getting going in an EQB is all very straightforward. Pretty much everything is just as it would be in a normal GLB or any other smaller Mercedes model, including the column gear stalk and the start button. So is the instrument screen ahead of you, though here it displays an EQ graphic replaced by a ready to start message once you activate the starter. Time to sample the Mercedes take on what a mid-sized family EV should be. Well, it sprints away pretty quickly, despite here tipping the scales at around 2.2 tonnes, about half the weight of an Asian elephant. Every EV these days is on the portly side, of course, but this one's got a particular weight problem because Mercedes, unlike most of its rivals, hasn't yet designed a specific chassis for the needs of its smaller electric vehicles, which is why this EQB must run on basically the same rather substantial steel and aluminium MFA2 platform used by its combustion-engined GLB showroom stablemate. For EV use, those underpinnings have had to be strengthened with a specially designed frame made out of extruded sections, hence the reason why this car is around 200 kilos heavier than most other mid-sized crossover EVs. You'd expect Mercedes to have countered that by fitting a more powerful propulsion system, but if anything, the opposite is true here. From launch, this EQB was only available in twin-motor 4MATIC all-wheel drive form, and if you cast a glance around the segment, you'll find that most rivals believe around 300 horsepower is necessary to properly propel a four-wheel drive EV in this class. Well, to approach that with this Mercedes, you've to stretch to the rather pricey top 350 version we're trying here. We 
The EQB 300 model that more customers are likely to choose has only 228 horsepower. This model's close relative, the EQA, sells best in front-driven 190 HP 250 form, but from the launch of the EQB, the brand wouldn't tell us whether this car would also be offered with that more affordable power plant. Perhaps this is just as well because the front-driven EQB 250 that at the time of making this film was on sale on the continental market is no ball of fire by EV standards, taking 9.2 seconds to get from rest to 62 miles an hour. Even the mainstream EQB 300 formatic variant 7.7 .7 second time is rather on the leisurely side for a £50,000 EV these days. The EQB 350 formatic that we're trying here improves that figure to a rather more rapid 6 seconds and both versions feature the twin digit limited top speed that's getting more common with EVs these days, in this case 99 miles an hour. Still, you won't be choosing an EQB as an autobahn burner, and if you did, the burning in question would primarily be through this model's rather restricted driving range. WLTP rated for these two formatic variants at a best of 257 miles. In a class where better versions of comparably priced rivals regularly deliver figures well over the 300 mile mark, We'll brief you on that in greater detail in our cost of ownership section. Mercedes says it's developed an EQB variant capable of a 500 kilometer or 310 mile range, but that will only match, and in some cases still not equal, the current class standard. To give you some perspective on that, the car that will ultimately be this EQB's closest segment competitor, the seven-seat version of Tesla's Model Y Long Range, can cover 331 miles between charges. That American rival benefits from a slightly larger battery than is on offer here. All EQBs featuring one 66.5 kilowatt hours in usable size, which sits between the axles and forms a structural part of the chassis. What this Mercedes can do is give you a lot more control than most of its competitors over how proactively you can use the battery energy that's available. For that purpose, there are a prodigious number of drive modes, starting with the usual comfort, sport and eco settings of the dynamic select system you control, as usual in a Mercedes, via this little silver rocker switch on the lower centre console. Plus, an individual menu allows you to create your own drive, steering and ESP drive parameters in the unlikely event you should want to. If you're wondering what these steering column shifter paddles are for in a car that's like every EV has a single speed transmission, the answer is that they control the level of brake regeneration, or to put it more simply, the amount of powertrain retardation and the energy harvesting you get to slow the car when you come off the throttle. Many rivals give you nothing more than a selectable on-off one-pedal drive switch for managing this, but Mercedes thinks you need more developing a fiendishly clever automatic system which the car defaults to at startup setting D, which uses sensors to recognise speed limits and other traffic, plus GPS data for upcoming bends and roundabouts, applying the regenerative braking accordingly. If you want to control things yourself, pulling on the right paddle selects the D plus setting you'll want for highway travel, in which mode there's virtually no off-throttle retardation at all. Alternatively, pull on the left paddle and you get either D minus medium recuperation or D minus minus high recuperation, the latter slowing the car so much that you hardly ever have to use the brake pedal, except when coming to a complete stop. If you ever to drive this car hard, you'll find that with D minus minus selected, approaching a corner fast and lifting off is a bit like braking then changing down with a conventional car, just a lot simpler. But of course, you won't habitually be driving this Mercedes hard, firstly because it isn't that sort of car, and secondly because you're usually quite conscious of its unremarkable driving range, and thirdly because the body rolls a bit in extremis and the steering gives you very little idea of what's happening through the front wheels. Its light feedback is very welcome in town though, where you can plump up that range figure with the energy harvesting that'll accompany a lot of starting and stopping. 
This is also where you can enjoy the benefits of this car's surprisingly tight 11.4 metre turning circle. This EQB's a good cruiser too. It sounds obvious to say that an EV of this sort is refined. Of course it is, there's no engine. But with quite a few rivals in this segment, all the lack of a combustion lump up front does is to magnify your perception of the remaining tyre roar, suspension creak and wind noise, most of which has been well damped down here. Talking of damping, this car seems to handle both slow and faster bumps and undulations rather better than its EQA stablemate. There seems to be a bit more wheel travel to compensate for things like speed humps and poorer tarmac tears. So it's less of an issue that the electronically adjusted damping system you can get on an EQB in other markets is more difficult to acquire here. At the time of this test, that useful feature was only being offered on a pricey limited run launch edition model and wasn't available elsewhere in the range as an option, though that may have changed by the time you view this film. You might hope that a family EV with four-wheel drive, particularly one with the mini Galandawagon looks of this EQB, might have a little extra capacity to offer on rougher surfaces, but that would require the kind of higher ride height that would further worsen this model's EV driving range. Hence the fact that its 154mm ground clearance figure is actually lower than some family hatchbacks. The formatic system can't even help you that much on slippery driveways or muddy car parks, not because of any fault in fundamental engineering. The extra front-mounted electric motor chips in almost instantly to help the main rear-mounted motor when slip is detected. Rather because the car's economy-orientated low rolling resistance tyres are found severely wanting for grip once you venture away from the tarmac. On the plus side though, this car can manage a bit of towing weight in contrast to many of its rivals, some of which haven't been rated for towing at all. An EQB can lug along a braked trailer of up to 1800 kilograms, so could manage a medium sized caravan, though what that would do to the car's EV range is anyone's guess. Finally, we'll tell you that on any EQB, you can add an element of semi-autonomous driving if you pay extra for a driving assistance package that includes the brand's active distance assist, Distronic system, which works with the Mercedes active steering assist setup. The Distronic feature is basically a super advanced adaptive cruise control for highway use that deals with braking and steering as well as regulating your distance to the car in front. In short then, there's plenty about this EQB that you might like, but whether you decide that to be enough in a class full of uber talented rivals will probably come down to how highly you value this car's rather cool Mercedes vibe and difficult to match seven seat capability. Either way, we reckon there's certainly a place for it in this growing market. The EQ brand is supposed to stand for progressive luxury, and we're told that this EQB interprets this mantra in an edgy and characterful way. The reality, of course, is that this is simply a different variant of the brand's GLB crossover model with bespoke EQ styling front and rear. It could just as easily have been called the GLB electric. That's certainly what seems to be served up here at the side, where changes over a combustion GLB are limited to differently styled alloy wheels, which are between 18 and 20 inches in size. We've got 19 inches here. As with the GLB, key styling touches include particularly short front and rear overhangs. Plus, there's the way that the lower window line kinks up here at the base of the C-pillar. The SUV vibe, meanwhile, is emphasized by squared off black clad wheel arches and aluminium roof rails, plus lower black side cladding embellished by this smart silver strip. Mercedes, though, wants to position this EQB slightly differently from its combustion stable mate. And the easiest way of doing that without incurring expensive retooling costs was to restyle the front and rear ends. The frontal treatment shares the combustion model's clamshell bonnet, 
but looks a sleek step away from the GLB's rather bluff visage with a horizontal fibre optic strip connecting the daytime running lights of the blue-tinged full LED headlamps. Because only AMG line trimmed variants are being offered in our market, EQBs here all come with twin blade chrome strips on this black grille panel, plus an assertive intake design beneath flanked by smart corner outlets. The rear looks like it does on every other EQ series Mercedes design with LED tail lamps merging seamlessly into a tapered LED light strip that flows above the brand badge and adds a sense of width. Unlike the GLB, the number plate sits lower, right down here in the bumper, allowing for a more smoothly styled tailgate, which is topped off by a subtle roof spoiler. Under the skin, the GLB's high-strength steel and aluminium MFA2 platform needed a good deal of re-engineering to take the extra weight of this EQB's battery system, nearly half a tonne. The lithium-iron cell pack is mounted within a rear section of raised floor, and much of it sits beneath the back seat. OK, time to check out cabin design, usually a strong point with smaller Mercedes models. That tall roof line allows for a notably raised hip point, which for older owners will ease getting in and out. Let's get behind the wheel, on the way to which the door shuts behind you with a pleasing quality thunk. Now, Mercedes didn't really need to redesign the GLB's cabin for this car, and it hasn't. Not at first glance, anyway. Delve into different display options available across the usual glitzy screen fest, common to all the smaller models from the Mart these days, and you'll find some EV-specific stuff. A right-hand rev counter replaced by a power and charge percentage meter, and a centre screen that, as with the brand's similarly sized plug-in models, gains an extra EQ menu, including pretty much everything you'll need to know about driving and using this car. Charging options, consumption info, and a superbly detailed energy flow monitor, which shows you powertrain operation in real time. All of that is as it would be in an EQA, but here, as EQB customers might want, it's all fashioned into a cabin with a slightly more SUV-like feel and a slightly higher seating height. Little touches help here, this aluminium-look tubular element on the dashboard on the passenger side, and the horizontal grab handle that's been fitted to each door, supposed to resemble a milled aluminium tube. As ever in a Mercedes, you're surrounded by premium touches, a glossy piano black coated centre console, a Nappa leather trimmed sports steering wheel, comfort spec heated seats stitched with Artico man-made leather, a jewel-like overhead lighting panel and intricately fashioned door cards with double-stitched Artico panels. Three circular vents decorate the mid-level part of the centre stack, with two further ones at either end of the dash. And these outlets are an integral part of the classy standard ambient lighting system that brings the interior alive at night with a choice of up to 64 different colours, which can even change based on temperature settings and which illuminate in different colours to show different charging stages. Luxury downsizers will love it all. The real talking point here, though, remains the widescreen cockpit package made up of two standard elongated 10-inch square colour TFT screens, one for the centre dash touchscreen media display, the other for the digital instrument display dials you view through the sophisticated three-spoke multifunction steering wheel. There are plenty of ways to interact with this whole MBUX, or Mercedes-Benz user experience, setup. Touchscreen, voice control and various touchpads. Don't worry, we'll talk you through it. Let's start with this centre stack display, your portal for interacting not only with that EQ menu, but also with all of this infotainment system's expected features, phone, navigation, radio, media and so on. There are sections for Wi-Fi connectivity and apps, allowing you to access everything from a web browser to info on weather, restaurants and hotels. And if you scroll down further, you'll access some of this screen's various so-called themes. Trip, efficiency, lounge, 
or you can configure your own, which combine preset layouts and colour styles so that you can quickly change the cabin ambience to suit your mood. Plus, you can scroll through a wide selection of informational screens featuring wondrous graphics. Overall, there's much to support the brand's claim that this MBUX package takes in-car connectivity to a new level. And with the EQB, unlike with the base spec GLB, the setup right across the range incorporates the brand's smartphone integration package, giving you Apple CarPlay and Android Auto smartphone mirroring. Also standard across the lineup is an impressive 3D hard disk navigation setup, incorporating what Mercedes calls electric intelligence. This always calculates the route that will get you to your destination fastest, taking into account charging times and allowing for route topography, traffic conditions and the weather. The MBUX system also includes a very good voice control system, activated by the phrase, Hey Mercedes! How may I help you? If you can't be bothered with voice control and don't want to stab away at a touch screen, then you'll need to get very familiar with the various manual touch pads that offer a further way to activate the infotainment elements. The main one being down here at the base of the center stack, offering the kind of useful functionality you'd have to do without in a rival Audi Q4 e-tron or Volkswagen ID4. Usually, we don't especially like touchpad controllers. On the move, they're difficult to accurately use on anything but smooth surfaces. But this particular one is the best of its kind, with easy functionality helped by the surrounding shortcut buttons for key vehicle features. Two more touchpads also feature, both much smaller and both here on the three-spoke multifunction steering wheel. The first on the left-hand spoke, offering yet another way of fiddling with features on the screen in the centre of the dash. The little touchpad on the right-hand steering wheel spoke is for customising what you see in the digital instrument display in the binnacle ahead. Flick on that right-hand touchpad and you'll bring up a horizontal menu for tailoring this instrument binnacle monitor's centre section with selectable drive assistance, telephone, navigation, trip, radio, media, screen setup and service features. Instrument screens of this kind these days can usually be customised to show in different layouts, though there aren't so many of those here. You can use this little pad to bring up a useful full screen display for the trip and drive assistance sections. But otherwise, everything's based around a layout with a central info section flanked by two virtual dials, all of it configurable. If you don't want the left-hand dial to show a speedometer, the space can be occupied by audio, trip itinerary or trip computer info. And the right-hand dial space, usually occupied by that power and charge percentage meter we mentioned earlier, can alternatively show a consumption screen, an eco display, a nav map or the drive assistance info that can also be shown between the dials. You can tailor the colour and style layout of both the centre stack, touchscreen media display and this digital instrument display via four available styles and display options. Blue themed classic, yellow themed sport, orange themed progressive and dark minimalistic understated. Got all that? Good. Enough on connectivity. What else do you need to know about this cabin? Well, there are areas where this EQB's premium pretensions slip a little, and not only because the lower down the dash you look, the harder and cheaper the plastics become. The air vents, for example, don't feel to the touch as great as they look to the eye. Though build quality from the Hungarian Kexmet plant seems strong, signs of cost saving can be found when you run your fingers around the edging around the door bins or along the footwell panels of the lower centre console. The freestanding centre screen section and the overhead lighting panel both flex when you prod them. And if you happen to have forked out well over £60,000 for a fully kitted out version of this car, the rather flimsy column-mounted transmission stalk it shares with the Mercedes Sprinter van may not be quite the kind of thing you'd have been expecting. What else? Well, getting comfortable on the supportive seats is easy, thanks to four-way lumbar support and plenty of seat and wheel adjustment. Unlike on a GLB, rear parking sensors are standard on all models, as is a rear-view camera. 
which is just as well because your over-the-shoulder vision is somewhat compromised by blind spots in each rear pillar. Another slight irritation is the fact that Mercedes hasn't followed the lead of some rivals in providing both USB-A and USB-C ports. They're all here of the smaller USB-C variety, which for certain devices might mean that you have to use unsightly converter leads in the areas where the twin ports are provided. There are two, this lovely butterfly-lidded box between the seats and this compartment at the bottom of the centre stack, which has a lovely slatted top that slides back to reveal twin cup holders and, on this plusher variant, a wireless charging mat. There's also a reasonably sized glove box and door pockets with recesses for bottles, and you additionally get ticket clips on the sun visors and this dual light lighting panel which incorporates buttons for the emergency assistance and SOS call features. Time to take a seat in the second row. Now this is an area where this EQB can't simply replicate what's on offer with its GLB showroom stable mate. As mentioned earlier, a huge, great half a tonne, 420 volt battery is, after all, positioned directly beneath the rear bench and double stacked under the back seat cushions. This is a design feature you might well guess without actually knowing about it. So significant is the rise in floor height necessary to accommodate all those lithium ion cells. The result is a bench base positioned much closer to the floor than you might be used to, which means your knees end up closer to your chest than they would usually be. Though, to be fair, this is an issue you'll only really be bothered by on longer trips. One advantage of this design approach is that these second row seats are a little higher set than those in front, which gives children a better view out and might make them a little less prone to car sickness. The relative narrowness of the cabin won't encourage you to try and fit in a third adult here in the centre unless you absolutely have to, but if that's necessary, it'll help that the transmission tunnel isn't too high. If there are only a couple of you, you'll be able to use this fold-down armrest with its pop-out cup holders. Headroom, measured at 840 millimetres, the same as a GLB, should be fine for taller folk, though there's a slight compromise to make if this lovely twin-paned panoramic glass roof has been fitted. Overall, you'll certainly be much better off in the second row here than you would be in the rear of an equivalent EQA or indeed most other mid-sized crossover EVs in this segment. This EQB has a bench that can be slid back and forth over a range of 140 millimetres, 90 millimetres to the front and 50 millimetres to the rear in its rearmost setting, offering up to 967 millimetres of leg space, enough for even six footers to get comfortable. The back rests recline too through eight stages. As at the front, it really does feel properly premium back here with its smartly contoured Artico faux hide upholstery and double red stitched door cards. Practicalities include seat back nets, reasonably sized door pockets with bottle holders and coat hooks next to reading lights in the overhead grab handles. Between the front seats, there's a further USB-C port with a open storage area above just below two silver rimmed circular vents. What about the third row seating? Well, it's optional on the continent, but EQB sold in our market have to have it. Mind you, we can't really see why you wouldn't want these extra rearmost chairs. And getting to them requires a certain degree of athleticism that'll probably be beyond Granny on her Sunday trip to the garden centre. That's because you have to step up and once you pull the second row backrest out of the way via this easy entry seat shoulder catch, the aperture that opens up for third row access is as narrow as it usually is with SUVs in this segment. Third row legroom is as restricted as it usually is with seven seaters of this size too. Now you see why virtually all SUVs with three rows of seats have to have a sliding centre row bench. Unless this middle row could be pushed forward a bit, these third row chairs would be basically unusable by all except very small children and eunuchs. 
Even with a bit of give and take from those ahead, an averagely sized adult isn't going to want to be here for too long. The seats aren't as thick and supportive as those ahead because they've got to fit beneath the floor and you'll need to erect their headrests every time you sit back here because otherwise those will dig uncomfortably into your back. As usual with a seven seat SUV, you rather sit with your knees up towards your stomach and headroom is at something of a premium. In fact, Mercedes says it isn't safe for someone over 1.65 metres in height, just under 5 foot 6 inches to be sat back here at all. But that won't matter much to most owners who only really want these rearmost pews for children. If that's the case for you, you'll be pleased to find that Mercedes hasn't forgotten to fit Isofix child seat fastening points back here. A surprisingly rare thing to find in the third row of mid-size seven-seaters. Plus, it's good to note that the window airbags extend back to cover these seats too. And talking of windows, these rearmost ones are decently sized and you get an overhead light. Twin cup holders are provided between the seats and on either side there's an elasticated side strap and recessed tray areas. Finally, let's take a look in the boot. Now you have to use the boot for cargo because unlike most of its EV rivals, this Mercedes can't provide any extra space under the bonnet. Another giveaway to the fact that this car's platform wasn't developed from scratch for use with electric vehicles. The luggage area here at the back is accessed via a standard easy pack powered tailgate. You access the cargo area across this in practically silver trimmed bumper lip, which will probably quickly get scratched unless you're very careful. As in any ordinary seven seat GLB, there's very little space to play with if all three rows are in use. And it's even worse with an EQB because due to the lack of that frunk underbonnet space we just mentioned, the charging lead bags have to sit here. It all means that with the third row upright, you'll be limited to carrying a few shopping bags and not a lot else. Recessed areas feature to the left and right, plus there are bag hooks. Unfortunately though, unlike in an ordinary GLB, the tonneau cover can't be stored beneath the floor, so when the third seating row is in use, you'll have to leave it cluttering up your garage. Most of the time, of course, you're going to be traveling with these rearmost chairs folded into the floor. A simple action activated by pulling on these red straps. That'll improve cargo capacity to a maximum of 465 litres. Obviously, you can vary your cargo capacity scenarios by playing with the positioning of the sliding middle bench. And once you've found one that works, you can grab a bit of extra capacity by altering the angle of the second row backrests into a more upright cargo position, which could be just enough to get suitcases in on an airport run, for instance. A conventional combustion GLB model, if you're interested, would give you 75 litres more room with the seats in this configuration. With this EQB's all-electric EQA cousin, you'd have 30 litres less space than is on offer here. If you're able to flatten the second row in this EQB, you can free up as much as 1,710 litres. That's only 95 litres less than a GLB, but there's no option to further extend this space with an optional fold-flat front passenger seat as you can in other countries with that car. Still, this EQB's boxy shape means that there's nearly twice as much cargo room with the seats all folded compared to what you get with a similarly configured EQA. In fact, there's 1.8 metres of loading length up to the front seat backs, which is nearly as much as you'd get in an apparently slightly bigger Skoda Kodiak. OK, what will you pay for this seven-seat, family-sized, all-electric, battery-powered Mercedes-Benz? Because this car bears the three-pointed star, you won't be expecting it to be inexpensive. It isn't. From launch, the brand was only offering the two four-matic all-wheel drive versions of this car, which at the time of this test in summer 2022 started with the EQB 300 at just over £53,500 and culminated with the EQB 350 variant we're trying here, priced from just over £55,000. 
There's a choice of two mainstream trim levels, AMG Line or, for an extra £3,000, the AMG Line Premium spec we're trying here. If Mercedes decides to import the front-driven single-motor 190 HP EQB 250 model you can choose on the continent, the entry price for this model line will be lower, but realistically, you're still going to need a budget of around £50,000. Something else the brand offers on the continent is a five-seat only EQB, but for the UK market, you have to have three seating rows in this car. To give you some perspective as to where the EQB sits in the Mercedes EQ lineup, we'll tell you that the smaller, identically engineered five-seat EQA would save you just over £2,000 in comparable form. The next model up, the larger segment five-seat EQC, costs quite a lot more from around £70,000. As for rivals, well, if you've perused the car magazines and websites, you'll see this EQB compared, usually unfavourably, to all kinds of other mid-sized premium and volume brand EV crossovers priced in the fifty to £60,000 bracket. We're not going to do that because it's rather missing the point, which is that none of those cars can offer the three seating rows that will draw most customers to an EQB. The only one of them that could potentially do that, the Tesla Model Y, wasn't being offered with its US market seven-seat option in Europe at the time of this test, and Tesla wouldn't put a timescale on when or if that option might be offered here. But things might have changed with that by the time you view this film. So we'll tell you that based on pricing for a five-seat Model Y in long-range form, at the time of this test, we'd expect that a seven-seat version of that car would cost you in the 58 to £60,000 bracket, about the same as the high-spec EQB 350 we're trying here. If you want seven seats in an EV, at the time of making this film, there were only two real alternative options, both rather unappealing, because both are based on converted vans. For less, there's the single-badge-engineered Stellantis Group EV design, a converted LCV, sold as either the Peugeot e-Rifter, the Vauxhall Combo e-Life, or the Citroen e-Berlingo. Those three are priced from around £30,000. If you can stretch way above what's needed for an EQB from around £70,000, there's the Mercedes EQV, which is an all-electric version of the brand's V-Class people carrier based on the company's eVito van. If, having considered all of this, you conclude that it is an EQB that you really want, then you're going to need to know just how generous Mercedes has been with standard kit. So let's take a look at that now. Now, most will probably be happy enough with the entry AMG line version, which gets AMG line body styling, and that gives you smart front and rear aprons and classy 18-inch AMG five-spoke wheels. Also included are LED high-performance headlights with adaptive high-beam assist. Plus, there's privacy glass, front and rear LED light bands, polished aluminium roof rails, an easy-pack powered tailgate, branded puddle lights, and a parking package that gives you rear parking sensors and a reversing camera. There's also cruise control with active speed limit assist, which can adapt your speed to the prevailing limit. Inside with base AMG line trim, you get heated AMG sports seats, red upholstery stitching with part Dynamica microfiber trim, black open pore Linden wood trim inlays, a Nappa leather trimmed sports steering wheel, brushed stainless steel sports pedals, branded illuminated door sills and AMG floor mats, plus leather, Thermotronic automatic climate control and also dimming rear view mirror and ambient lighting with a choice of 64 colours. And there's also a seat comfort package with electro pneumatic four way lumbar support for heated front seats trimmed in black or beige man made Artico leather upholstery. The driving stuff's quite interesting. So the usual Mercedes Dynamic Select driving mode system with eco, comfort and sport modes. But in this case, it's been embellished with a brake recuperation setup activated by paddles behind the steering wheel. This defaults to a D 
auto setting that makes all the decisions for you. Or you can vary the level of brake regeneration through four levels. D plus for coasting, then D for low recuperation, D minus, which is medium recuperation, and D minus minus, high recuperation. In other words, you'll not want for drive settings. Media connectivity across the range is taken care of by the brand's MBUX multimedia system with widescreen cockpit, two 10-inch digital displays with touchpad. The centre screen incorporates Bluetooth, a 225-watt DAB tuner, and smartphone integration, including Android Auto and Apple CarPlay, plus hard disk navigation with what Mercedes calls electric intelligence. This setup always calculates the route that will get you to your destination fastest, taking into account charging times and allowing for route topography, traffic conditions and the weather. The MBUX system also includes a very good voice control system activated by the phrase, Hey Mercedes. Every EQB also comes as standard with a three-year subscription to the Mercedes Me Connect vehicle monitoring package, which works via a free app. This can allow you to set charging times and activate timings for the car's pre-entry climate control system. Plus, as with all larger Mercedes models, it reminds you when a service is due and can automatically detect and share with you details on your car's wear and tear items. In addition, the app includes a parked vehicle locator, gives you a one-touch button for fast accident and breakdown recovery, and automatically alerts the rescue services in the event of an accident. It can even track your EQB if it's stolen, tell you if it's left pre-agreed geographical boundaries if you lend it out, and tell you where the vehicle is if you forget where you've parked it. The app also works with the standard Mercedes Urban Guard system, which combines an alarm with tow-away protection. If someone ever tries to tamper with your EQB, you'll be informed via the app. What else? Well, as usual with an EV, there's single-speed automatic transmission. The 66.5 kilowatt hour battery comes paired to an 11 kilowatt AC onboard charger and a 100 kilowatt DC onboard charger. And you get a couple of five meter charging cables, a mode two lead for plugging into a conventional socket and a mode three cable for use with wall boxes or AC public charging points of up to 11 kilowatts. A year subscription to the Ionity Rapid Charging Network also comes included in the price. Want to go further? Then, as mentioned earlier, you'll be directed to the plusher AMG line premium trim level that we have here. That gets you bigger 19-inch AMG 5 twin-spoke wheels, a sliding twin-pane panoramic glass roof, keyless go, keyless entry, a 10-speaker, 225-watt advanced sound system and a wireless charging mat. Right, that covers off the standard stuff. Now, I hope you've been paying attention if you're an EQB customer wanting an individual specification because there aren't many options. So, if you want more kit, you've no choice but to move up a spec level. You can add in a tow bar, not always possible on an EV, to take advantage of the 1,800 kilogram braked towing capacity. And there's the option of various child seats, a reversible boot mat, and the lateral roof rail carrier bars that'll enable you to specify the optional two-cycle bicycle rack and 400-litre roof box. You'll probably also need to pay more for your choice of paintwork because there's only one standard shade, solid night black. Otherwise, you'll need to pay more for one of the metallic colours. We've got one of those, Cosmos Black, here. On to safety. Now, this car's MFA2 platform was one of the first to be engineered by Mercedes at the brand's Technology Centre for Vehicle Safety in Sindelfingen, which develops vehicle structures based on findings from research into real accidents. Every single body shell component of this model was developed according to the loads and stresses encountered in real-world crashes with respect to material thickness, sheet steel quality and joining technology. And of course, this EQB includes all the usual camera-driven kit. 
As standard, you get active brake assist, autonomous braking, one of those setups that scans the road ahead as you drive, warns you of potential accident hazards, and is also capable of autonomously braking the car if you don't respond to the warnings, or perhaps aren't able to. Testing has indicated that this whole setup will eradicate 20% of nose-to-tail accidents and decrease their severity to a further 25% of cases. Active lane keeping assist is also standard across the EQB range, able not only to warn you if you drift across lane markings, but also capable of applying subtle steering lock to ease the car back to where it ought to be. In addition, Mercedes includes another important camera safety feature, attention assist, which monitors your driving reactions to detect drowsiness. There's Active Speed Limit Assist, which detects the speed limit and displays it in the instrument cluster, along with Traffic Sign Assist, which uses a camera to scan speed limit signs, so navigation data always displays the current limit. The multi-beam LED headlamp system includes Adaptive High Beam Assist to automatically dip your headlights for you at night in the face of oncoming traffic. Plus, the Mercedes Me Connect app, Another thing we mentioned earlier includes an e-call emergency call system that will automatically alert the emergency services to your exact location should the airbags be deployed in an accident. More familiar standard safety stuff includes ABS brakes that automatically prime themselves in wet weather and flash the rear lights in emergency stops to warn following motorists. Plus there's an ESP stability control system with acceleration skid control and curve dynamic assist for extra cornering traction. If all that's not enough to keep you out of the hedge, there are also twin front side and curtain airbags the curtain bags extending right back to cover the third row. Plus, there's a driver's knee bag, anti-whiplash head restraints, Isofix child seat fastenings for both second and third rows, a deformable steering column, crash-responsive emergency lighting, and a pedestrian-friendly bonnet. In addition, you get a tyre pressure monitoring system, and there's hill start assist to stop you from rolling backwards on uphill junctions. If you want to go further and get some of the choiciest elements of Mercedes camera-driven safety tech, you'll be offered the chance to spend around £1,500 more to get the brand's driving assistance package, which includes a package of key extra camera safety elements, amongst which are features that also give this car limited autonomous driving capability. Let's talk you through it all. The driving assistance package menu starts with active blind spot assist, which can warn you of vehicles in your blind spot during a lane change and can help to avoid a collision by means of one-sided braking intervention. It includes an exit warning function, which alerts passengers if they're about to open their doors in the face of oncoming traffic. And there's braking stuff too, of course. The active brake assist with turning manoeuvre function feature can help to avoid collisions with vehicles ahead, with crossing traffic, and also with pedestrians and or mitigate their consequences. And there's active emergency stop assist, which initiates immediate emergency braking if evasion is impossible. There's also an evasive steering assist that can support you in making evasive manoeuvres if a pedestrian or cyclist suddenly appears in your path and there's a pedestrian warning function which activates near pedestrian crossings. Plus, you also get a clever route-based speed adjustment feature which has an end of traffic jam function and works with GPS data to automatically adapt your speed before curves, roundabouts and junctions. As we mentioned, the driving assistance package also includes limited autonomous driving capability to suit the mood of the moment. That comes courtesy of the PAC's Active Distance Assist or Distronic system, which is designed to operate on a dual carriageway and works with the Mercedes Active Steering Assist setup. 
The Distronic feature is basically a super advanced adaptive cruise control that automatically regulates your distance to the car in front and can, if necessary, remotely slow the car with up to 50% of stopping power. It also works the active speed limit assist feature we mentioned earlier that automatically sets the cruise control to speed limit signs as you pass them. Finally, active steering assist keeps you in the center of your designated lane and will, if needed, apply subtle steering correction to ease you back to where you should be. It's all very reassuring. The elephant in the room here is driving range, so let's get straight to it. For either of the four Matic variants offered at launch, the EQB 300 and this EQB 350, Mercedes was quoting a range figure between 250 and 257 miles. A figure which wouldn't be much improved if the brand were to decide to also import the front-driven EQB 250 variant, at least if our recent test of the similar EQA 250 model is any guide. To give you some perspective on that, even a little Renault Zoe Super Mini is rated at 238 miles between charges. For all-wheel drive versions of mid-size crossover EVs like this EQB, the current class benchmark is somewhere just over the 300-mile mark, and the seven-seat version of Tesla's Model Y Long Range, which, when it finally makes our market, will be this car's closest rival, manages 331 miles. Part of the issue here is weight, and partly that's because this EQB, as we've been saying all the way through this test, isn't based around underpinnings ever really designed for an electric car. The MFA2 platform borrowed from combustion engined Mercedes compact models that it uses instead had to have all kinds of strengthening structures welded into it to cope with the 66.5 kilowatt hour battery packs, 480 kilo weight which explains why a car which actually isn't much bigger than, say, a Ford Focus Estate can weigh in when fully equipped at well over 2.2 tonnes, about 200 kilos more than the class norm. It can't only be that, though. A Polestar 2, for instance, our current favourite in this segment, weighs even more than this EQB. Clearly, ultimate range depends on a real depth of EV engineering that, to some extent, this Mercedes just doesn't have. Perhaps that's a touch unfair. This is, after all, a seven-seater, and it's worth pointing out that seven-seat MPVs like the Peugeot e-Rifter, the Vauxhall Combo e-Life, and the Citroen e-Berlingo can't even manage to get 200 miles from a charge. We should also mention that at the time of this test in summer 2022, Mercedes told us it was planning to eventually add a 500-kilometer variant to the EQB lineup. And such a driving range increase to 310 miles would certainly, presumably at a price, bring this EQB closer to the top class standard. It's also true that beyond battery cell development, there are some aspects of electrified engineering here that rivals could learn from. The variable brake regeneration system, for instance, which is the best we've tried, offering a D auto setting that makes all the decisions for you, or allows you to vary the level of brake regeneration through four levels, D plus for coasting, then D, low recuperation, D minus, medium recuperation, and D minus minus, high recuperation. There's also the electric intelligence embellished navigation system, which takes charging locations, charging times, route, topography, traffic conditions, and the weather into account when planning your premium route. If only it could also tell you whether a charger is occupied and book a space for you at the time you'll need to use it, the system would be perfect. But of course it can't because the current global charging network isn't that sophisticated. And in the UK, it isn't even that comprehensive given the flood of EVs taking to the roads and expecting to plug in. Mercedes claims to offer the world's biggest charging network with over half a million AC and DC charging points across 31 countries, 200,000 of those in Europe. But that's in Europe. Still, a three-year subscription to the Mercedes Me Charge public charging network comes as standard with this car. 
and the EQB's EQ menu charging option screen is very good at searching out charging points for you, with those in the Mercedes Me network offset with green power. The EQB has the usual 11 kilowatt AC charging capability, but it can't offer the 150 kilowatt DC onboard charger you'll find with some rivals like the Ford Mustang Mach E and the Polestar 2. And it's way off the 350 kilowatt maximum charge rate you'd get in this segment in a Hyundai Ioniq 5 or a Kia EV6. Instead, this EQB uses a lesser 100 kilowatt onboard charger, which connected to a 110 kilowatt public charger will allow the car to charge from 10 to 80% in 32 minutes. Mind you, that's only around five minutes less than rivals with 150 kilowatt onboard DC chargers can manage. More commonly, of course, you'll be powering up from the wall box you'll need to install in your garage. If that wall box is of the 7.4 kilowatt sort, which at the time of this test, Mercedes would sell you for 525 pounds, charging from which to 100% takes 10 hours and 45 minutes. If you install an 11 kilowatt wall box, it'll take just over seven hours. With a 400 volt, 16 amp wall box, you could reduce that to five hours and 45 minutes. Using that center display EQ menu's charging option screen, you can set a departure time for when you'll next need the car so that charging is potentially delayed to coincide with cheaper night rate electricity. And you can manage your charging program either via the screen or by using the Mercedes Me Connect app, which can allow you to precondition the cabin so that you won't have to waste energy using the climate fan when you first set off. The EQ menu has a consumption section which allows you to monitor overall energy consumption in miles per kilowatt hour with an average from start reading and the percentage drain from driving, heating and cooling and other consumers. There's also a selectable graphical screen that can show you the car's consumption and energy recuperation over different time periods. 7.5, 30 or 90 minutes, all the last three hours. The EQ menu also includes a pleasingly detailed energy flow display with a battery percentage readout, the display glowing blue, off throttle and red when you're using energy. What else? Well, the fact that Mercedes has optimised aerodynamics using special front and rear aprons, an enclosed underbody, specially adapted front and rear spoilers and specially optimised aero wheels obviously maximises range. The fact that the brand standardises a heat pump for this car, a pricey option with many rivals, also helps this forming part of a sophisticated thermal management system. The heat pump compresses refrigerant under high pressure, creating heat that warms up the flowing air through the ventilation system. The climate setup, they're needing less energy from the battery in colder weather. All of this helps to explain why this car gets a little closer to the range promised by its dashboard indicator than some rivals we've tried. We've regularly averaged consumption of about 3.2 miles per kilowatt hour during this test. Some way off Mercedes claim 3.9 miles per kilowatt hour figure, but enough to regularly deliver range figures well over 200 miles. On to issues of tax. Because of this 0% CO2 figure, there's no first year road tax license to pay and you won't be saddled with inner city congestion charges. Well, not until 2025 anyway. More significantly, your company benefiting kind tax rating will be pitched at Group 2, which at the time of this test meant an annual payment of around £399 for 40% earners or £200 for lower rated 20% earners. But that's still massively less than such people would need to fork out for a comparable combustion-engined Mercedes GLB. One of those is rated at BIK Group 33 for a base diesel GLB or Group 36 for a base petrol GLB. Service intervals are every year or 15,000 miles. Fixed price servicing is available across the EQB range and most buyers opt for the Mercedes Service Care Plan based either on a two-year, two-service deal, three years with three services, or four years with four services. Whatever package you opt for, it'll cover the cost of all recommended service items, such as brake fluid, air filters, and screen wash. 
Brake pads too, though you'll hardly ever have to replace those in an EQB thanks to the brake regeneration system. It's also worth mentioning that the standard Mercedes Me Connect Services package includes remote self-diagnostic capability, enabling your EQB to monitor wear and tear items and alert your local dealer to let you know if something needs seeing to. You'll get a message both on the dashboard and via your Mercedes Me app, reminding you when a service is due. As for ownership peace of mind, well, you're limited to the usual unremarkable three-year or 60,000-mile Mercedes warranty. You can extend it to five years at extra cost, but you shouldn't have to. There's up to 30 years warranty against perforation due to corrosion. The brand also offers pan-European Mercedes-Benz roadside assistance, which is free for the first three years and thereafter automatically renewed for 12 months every time the car undergoes a full Mercedes-recommended service until the car is 30 years old. The insurance groupings range, as usual with an EV, is unreasonably high. Insurers are frightened of the higher write-off value of an electric vehicle in an accident. The groupings here range from 46E for an EQB 300 formatic to Group 47E or 48E for this EQB 350 formatic. Finally, residual values, as with any Mercedes, should be strong. We can expect this EQB to at least replicate the showing of its GLB combustion stablemate, which returns up to 55% of its original purchase price after three years and 36,000 miles. Indeed, it might actually do a little better. The next model up in the EQ range, the EQC, returns up to 58% over the same period. We feel much more convinced by this EQB than we did by its EQA stablemate, mainly because this more versatile design has a unique selling point denied not only to the EQA, but to most other mid-sized EVs out there, seven seats. So larger families who lack a lottery win and don't want a converted van can now join the electric vehicle revolution. What'll they find here? The usual eye-catching Mercedes front of cabin experience, classy screen technology, and the rather smug sense of self-satisfaction that comes in having a car with the three-pointed star on your driveway. On top of that, the brake regeneration system is excellent. The extensive Mercedes Me charging network and the easy way you can pay to use it is an obvious attraction, and residual values will probably be very competitive. All of these attributes are needed because in the debit column, there's premium pricing and a number of downsides that basically relate back to the fact that this car's MFA2 platform, though heavily modified for battery duty, wasn't originally designed for an EV. Amongst these are the lack of storage space beneath the bonnet, the limited 100 kilowatt battery charging rate, and most importantly, driving range that's about 20% off the class best. If you really need seven seats in your EV, we think the EQB selling points will outweigh these demerits relatively easily. If you don't, then the issues we've mentioned may well tempt you to look elsewhere. But do that and you'll find this Mercedes model's family flexibility difficult to replicate, even for this kind of money. All of which means that right here, right now, this is the best affordable EV Mercedes makes. And that makes it a difficult car to ignore.